Really excited uh, to be back at our Get Stuff Done podcast. Uh, this is episode 12. And I'm really excited about our guest here today. You know, a man that, uh, you know, we grew up not too far from each other. Uh, I was in South Jamaica, Queens. And back there as uh, young people, we were just in admiration at this great three letters, you know, run DMC. And I'm here with one of the uh, talented brothers from that organization and that just entertainment a pioneer, a Daryl Matthews McDaniels, better known by his stage name, a DMC. Uh, he's a founding member of the hip hop group Run DMC and is considered one of the pioneers of hip hop uh, culture. Who would have thought hip hop would have brought us this far? That's Brother, crazy. Welcome here in City Hall. And it's just really good to see you. You have a powerful story, powerful narrative, ups and downs, twists and turns. Uh, but you're still here. We all do, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I, I'm sitting here uh, looking at your book, uh, Daryl McDaniels, 10 Ways Not to Commit Suicide. Uh, you have a comic book as well. And you have a book uh, by book. your child. Is it son or daughter? Well, no, that's me in the third grade. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a story about me in the third grade getting teased, bullied, and picked on, but finding mm. my own voice in. Mm. Following your dream. Because mm, we all love have it. dreams. Love it. What schools did you go to, by the way? Well, elementary school, St. Pasco Baylon Elementary School in Hollis, Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. It was one of the last Catholic schools in the neighborhood. Mm. The priests and the nuns were, we can't give up on the little black kids. We got to <laughs> stay here for them. So they trooped it out. But it's crazy, Mr. Mayor. I took three trains and two city buses to travel from Queens to go to Rice High School. 124th Street in Lenox, yeah. And okay. they was known for basketball. Right, 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 But it was right, all right. boys bas it was all boys Catholic high school. And I, I was a smart enough student to get in there. But the beautiful thing about making that trip, all the kids used to say, why in the world do you take three trains and two buses? Rice was a good school. Mm -hmm. But plus, when I got there, it gave me a firsthand look at the culture of hip hop before the records. Mm, mm. So when I got to Rice, most of the kids in the, in the school were from the Bronx, Manhattan, and Harlem. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, Harlem has been a beautiful renaissance. Right, right. It's Harlem now. Right. But back in the days, it was Harlem. Oh, listen, L up trust in Harlem, me. super fine, uh. all of that. <laughs> so, you know, the rap records came out, the hip hop records came to Queen. Hip hop came to Queens via the live performances on the cassette tapes, the recordings. But then it was the records, rappers the light message and all. Right, right. But when I got the rice, those kids, they grew up there. Mm. They lived there before the era of the recorded hip hop. So I'm learning about all the hip hop from 79 to 73. So I'm learning about the purpose and the um the motive behind these young people creating this music. Now it was for fun, mm. but I discovered that it was really about inspiration, motivation education. Right. You know, right. Here, here's who I am. Here's who you are. Now, since people think we have no resources, what can we do? So I learned that the music, the art, the dance, the style, the poetry all had a purpose to allow us to evolve. And you got to think about it. The Bronx was burning in the city. Right. That's right. I grew well, up in Harlem Queens. Well, Harlem also, Harlem. Yeah, Harlem. South Jamaica, Queens. Yes, South Jamaica. You know, yes. all, uh, every place we were. I, I looked at uh, the Supreme Team documentary uh, that talked about during that time. You know, uh, we were coming out of the heroin, getting ready to enter yep. the crack. It was a different time yep. for all of us. But when you started out, it wasn't even about making money. It was about no. t telling your message. How was it back then, the three of you coming together? What, mm -hmm. the, what, was, what was the thought back then? We grew up in the same neighborhood in the two hours or the three hours that you had at a hip hop party, block mm. party, park party, mm. a house party was heaven. <laughs> it was to get us away from all the pressures and the hell that was outside, you know, right. in the real everyday lives. But it was basically based on creativity. Mm -hmm. For me, hip hop wasn't, like you said, it wasn't about entertainment and fortune and fame. I was like, oh, shoot, you could tell stories about who you are over music. Right. So it gave this little kid, Daryl McDaniels from Queens, New York, I could tell people who I am. Mm -hmm. when, did, when did you realize that 
hey, I'm on to something. Well, it, it took a minute because you remember in the early years of hip hop, it was no albums, it was no videos, we wasn't on MTV. It was singles. Mm. And people was like, it's a fad. Where are you going to be in in three years? But I, I would say with the advent of MTV, because mm -hmm. MTV was significant because it, it put all of us young kids you know, from these ghettos and lower income neighborhoods, it put us in everybody's living room. Interesting. So Interesting. Beverly Hills and all over, people were seeing this, this culture, mm -hmm. this way of life. And uh, some of the people were a little nervous. Right, about right, About having right. these the image, the image, what it, what exactly. it looked like and uh, uh, what it represented. It's almost, I was telling someone the other day, it's almost like jazz. Whenever you had 100%. those genres that were created uh, by, you know, uh, black and brown folks, it was actually demonized until yep. it reached a level of acceptance. And now was, jazz is, is, is cool and hip, and hip hop, hip -hop is, is cool everywhere. And yeah. Music it was scores. Yeah, right. But it right. was the truth. Right. You right. know, when you think about the 70s, people thought New York City was heaven, mm -hmm. you know, which was cool. New York has always been a cool place to be. Right. But our reality wasn't fortune, fame, and opulence. Mm -hmm. So hip hop basically allowed real people to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it allowed us not to be ashamed of our conditions, but by sharing those truths, by having that communication, by having that interaction, it was like, what could we do next? The message was the message. Right, right, it's right. It's like a jungle. The message right. was a mental health record. It's like a jungle sometimes. Don't push me. But then Planet Rock was- I'm close to was, the edge. Right? I'm close to the edge. I'm right. trying not to. But then Planet Rock was, we know a place where everybody could eat, where we don't have to fight, where we don't have to sell drugs in our own communities. And it's mm. the arts mm. that mm. allowed us to make those dreams come true. You know what's deep, true. though? Uh, the Aerosmith piece- sort of took it to another level. And I was reading something the other day, how there was a lot of tension behind that Aerosmith uh, collaboration. Uh, people were angry. It was taboo. It was really mad. Right. Yeah, right. The, 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 the white, dedicated, religious rock fans, <laughs> this is blasphemy. What, who, these black young rappers, you know, it was like, what are they doing? But what they didn't understand was... It's all rock and roll. Mm. Now, first of all, let's be true. Blues is the roots. Everything else is the, the fruits. So mm -hmm. you could talk to the greatest white rock stars and gods, Keith Richards, Mick Jagger, Steven Tyler, Joe Perry from Smith. You will sit down and talk to them about them. They will talk about the black blues mm -hmm. artists mm -hmm. that started us. So for us, in the beginning, we mm -hmm. didn't have access to studios, so we had to find things to rap over. So we took the break beats. Of course, we took it from James Brown. Mm -hmm. He always had a funky drummer beat. Of course, we took it from Parliament Funkadella because mm -hmm. they had the funk. Of course, like you just mentioned, we took it from jazz. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of instrumentals. When the, when the world threw disco away, another man's trash is another man. <laughs> Give it to us. So we started using it. But also in the crates of Grandmaster Flash, mm -hmm. Cool Herc and the Grand Wizard Theodore were rock records. Mm, love you know it, what love I'm it. saying? You know, uh, a movie I saw the other day, I was on the plane and didn't even realize I would like it, but I really enjoyed it. Elvis. It was incredible. He And he talks about his beginning and, you know, going to the- In the movie, the who was he hanging with? There you go. That's right. <laughs> who was he hanging with? He went into the Enough black church. Said. He saw it. Right, exactly. right. And it just showed- He's going a little Richard for advice. Right, right. Honey, just do your thing. <laughs> You know, no, 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 you sounded like Little Richie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what's, what's interesting is that don't push me, I'm close to the edge. Mm -hmm. You know, you were close to the edge, and that's what your book is about, 10 Ways Not to Commit Suicide. Yeah. You know, talking about this uh, mental health piece, something that really uh, men of color don't like to really talk about. I right, because they think it's not cool. Right. There's this stigma, oh, you ain't supposed to have feelings, you ain't... The most powerful thing that you can do is talk about when you're weak, scared, afraid, and vulnerable. Mm. Then your power will come to you. But we have been programmed and hypnotized not to do that. So over the course of many generations, we mask our true feelings and our emotions. And how do we do that? By harmful, destructive behaviors. Mm. If something's going on with me, I'm going to go fight everybody. Right. If I don't want to fight anybody, 
I'm going to abuse myself. I'm going to take drugs. I'm going to take alcohol to try to calm those feelings down. And if I don't want to hurt you and if I don't want to hurt myself, you think your only outlet is suicide. I don't want to be here to deal with this. Mm. So I grew up, had a great life, had the best parents ever, ever coming up in St. Albans, Queens. Mom uh, and dad. Mom and dad. Byford, son of Byford, brother of Al. Banners, my mother runs my pal. It's McDaniels, not McDonald's. These rhymes are Daryl's. Those burgers are Ronald. <laughs> I ran down my family tree, my mother, my father, my brother, and me. Oh. So I had a great life. And then I got the opportunity to have hip-hop culture bless me to give me a purpose to help inspire, motivate, and educate people. Mm. But I'm still human. I still go through things. A lot of us, we mask our feelings through harmful and destructive behaviors. So long story short, in 1993, at the height of my career, everybody, run DMC, you are God, you are pioneers, you are legends. When people was praising me, I felt like killing myself. Mm. And I didn't know why. There was just this void in my life. And I thought, oh, if I die tomorrow, people know run DMC. There's records, there's videos, there's books. But I want you all to know Daryl. Daryl's no different from any human being well, on the face of the earth. So mm -hmm. I call my mother up. Now, I should have said, Mom, I'm dealing with something this and that, but you don't want to worry your parents. You know what I'm saying? So what I was doing, I was dealing with my own thing. So I called my mom up and said, Mom, I want to write a book. You know, I got my records. What time was I born? What hospital? What day? She tells me everything. I knew my birthday was May 31st. So hung up the phone. An hour goes by, Mr. Mayor. So all I wanted to do was say, in addition to my music, my Adidas contract, Walking This Way with Errol Smith, and my tricky songs. I'm really just Daryl McDaniels mm. like all of you. Mm -hmm. An hour goes by, she calls back with my father on the phone. Hey, son. Hey, dad. What's up? We have something else to tell you. I was 35 years old. I was an alcoholic, metaphysical, physical, suicidal wreck who was thinking of killing himself to right. hit me with this. We have something else to tell you. You was a month old when we brought you home and you're adopted, but we love you. Bye. Click. Mm, so mm. that was a life-changing re revelation, mm -hmm. something that shook me to my roots. But then I calmed down and I said, wow, my Adidas walk this way. Everything I ever did, I shouldn't be ashamed of being adopted or even a foster kid. So I started talking about it. That led me to say, you know what? I need to be of strong body and mind. So I went to rehab to stop drinking. Mm. And Mr. Man, when I got to rehab, I found the most gangster thing an individual, man, woman, boy, and girl, black, white, Puerto Rican, young, old, could do for themselves. I found this thing called therapy, where I was able to talk about how I felt and not be ashamed. My therapist said, you can be mad. You can be angry. You can be confused. You can have anxiety. Okay, right, so right. me being in hip-hop, hip-hop is about keeping it real. I get out of rehab and therapy, and people say, yo, DMC, what's up with you? I would tell them, yo, I was going to kill myself, this and that. And all the celebrity stuff would leave 100% of the time. Two things about me being honest with who I am and not being ashamed. These two things would happen. They would say, Daryl, thank you for telling me that. Me too. Or if it wasn't them, they would go, my mother, my father, my sister, brother. So I realized that the King of Rock thing, the thing that I did with Run and Jay, the Adidas deal was just a setup for what I was really put here to do. Find, finding a purpose is, is, is it's crucial. Key. You know, it's yep. you know, it interesting uh, being told that you are adopted. You know, I'll never forget when my sister's dad died mm. and I didn't know that she had a different father. And I was in, I was in, you know, school when I got the, you know, found out about it. Right. And, you know, I was depressed. That taught me apart. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's so... A, how a child is impacted, I can only imagine you were a y young man right. and you learned and it impacted you. Yep. You know, that's one of the most devastating things that you can learn in well, life. Depression is based on traumas. Mm -hmm. Traumas that people tell you, you're too young to be thinking about that. Don't deal with that. Oh, man up and stuff like that. No, deal with those feelings right there. You know, when, when kids go through stuff, you shouldn't say, you're too young to, how do you feel? Right. Why do you feel like that? They will tell you. Without so that's why I did the children's book, Daryl's mm -hmm. Dream. Uh, all of the stuff that we go through in life as adults, mm -hmm. our work environment, our interaction with our family, our friends, your career, everything that we go through, our playground is your work, your home, your friendship area. It's the same thing for the children, but their environment is the household, mm -hmm. the backyard, the streets, 
the classroom and the schoolyard. So a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of confusion begins there. And when we bottle it up, we hold all that in. So it took me 35 years to just wake up and say, I don't know what's going on with my life. What is this void in me? Sure, I was fine as DMC, but there were things and feelings that I wasn't allowed to or didn't think it was cool to address. Like, if, if I would have known earlier than 35, I'd have been at eight years old telling everybody, I'm scared to death. I don't want to do that because I'm dealing <laughs> right. with my truth. And by admitting I'm, I'm scared, I'm vulnerable, I'm nervous, that's your victory. I tell kids how I communicate with the kids. I say it's the hip hop's 50th anniversary. Yeah, I've been involved for 40 of the 50 years. <laughs> and I tell kids, I'm honest, right. I still get scared. I use these words before I go on stage. Right, so right. that's just telling a kid, even if they don't know Run DMC, oh, it's cool to be scared. And, and, and you know what? There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. And people look at the celebrity status of performance. They don't know the hours working in, uh, you know, in the studio. They don't know what it's like being on the road around uh, the stress of performance. The stress take, is. Take, take us into that a little bit of, you know, moving around. I'll never forget one day, and it's that image stays in my mind often, you guys were coming back from performing overseas somewhere, and I saw the three of you walking to, it was Rochdale. You were walking mm -hmm. inside Rochdale, and everybody was saying, let's run DMC. <laughs> they don't know how beat down, tired, and overworked we were, but we mm -hmm. still were cordial. Mm -hmm. But you got to understand, doing your thing takes energy. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot out of you. And like you just said, I was speaking with Jesse Jackson about 25 years ago. He said they look at people in the media, they look at celebrities, and he basically said, MTV Cribs is cool, but it shows results. Mm -hmm. It don't show process. Mm -hmm. So everybody's looking at us. They'll look at you and say, oh, his life is perfect and this and that and this and They don't know you get sad. Right. They don't know you have thoughts of, oh, am I sure? They don't know that you have doubts. But we mask those truths so everybody will look at a so-called celebrity and think they're indestructible. My greatest power was having people who looked up to me all these years realizing that the mighty king of rock, there is none higher. Sucker MC should call me sire. Is weak and vulnerable like all of us. And you know, that's the breakthrough. And you know what's fascinating is that that's why you have to really find your center. You know, you know yes. people talk about that. I get up early in the morning, meditate, you know, exercise, get my green smoothie. Uh, if you don't take care of yourself, it's almost like the... the uh, pilot saying when you're on an aircraft, put the mask, if the cabin pressure drops, place the mask on yourself before you do who you yes. place it on who you're traveling with. That's how life is. You got to take care of yourself. That's you how know? life And is, we're not yeah. doing that. We're so busy. Giving to right. other people, but you won't be effective if you're not okay. Well said. And you know, you are doing something amazing that I like. Uh, in 2006, you started uh, and founded the Felix organization, organization to help children and foster care. We're doing some amazing stuff around foster care uh, that was important to me. Whatever look you at, need me to do, I'm there. Love it. When we look at the numbers, uh, when a child age out of uh, not having the support that they deserve, right. we give, we did something called Fair Futures, allow children to age out and learn at a later age with life coaches. Uh, we're doing a lot. We're paying college tuition for those who want to go to college. And giving them a stipend for if they go to, you know, a one of our schools. Without People a doubt. Brought, without uh, a they doubt. don't want to be babysat. Right. They just need an opportunity. That's beautiful. That no, without a That's doubt. That's the exact reason why we started the Felix tell organization. Tell me about that. Tell me what it's about and what are you doing? What is uh, well, it's, it's, uh, and, and, and tell me about the name Felix. Mm -hmm. Well, we found out later that Felix means happiness. Okay. <laughs> but we named it Felix to explain to people, to make people understand what adoption or foster care is. So we had to come up with an example. So we grew up with Felix the Cat on TV. So we created <laughs> in his this, bag, his bag of tricks. Yeah, in the bag of tricks. You know what I'm saying? He can make anything happen. Um, we came up with a scenario where a dog gets adopted by a cat family. Mm -hmm. And they, they won't name him Rover. They don't name him Fido. They give him a cat name. But he grows up and he realizes, why I can't climb trees? Why I don't like playing with yarn and this and that? Why I don't like milk? And they go, oh, 
I'm Felix Pizarro. never told you, but you're not really a cat. But then when they tell him that, they tell him you're still perfect just the way you are. Your situation doesn't define who you are. Matter of fact, since you're a dog, you can still be the greatest cat that ever existed. <laughs> so we gave him inspiration to let him know and these children, your situation doesn't define who you are. Mm. You do. Take advantage of every opportunity, especially the ones that's educational, artistic, and creative. And there's nothing in this world that you won't be able to do. My therapist had to tell me because I was acting differently when I found out I was adopted. Mm. She said, that's just your situation. Right, right. Don't become that right. label. You could be a doctor, lawyer, whatever, well whatever. Said. I could. So what you're doing is regardless of a person's situation, you're allowing them to become the people they were put here to be. I searched for my birth mother. Mm. I grew up in Queens. She was in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. I searched for her. I found her. I found two brothers and a sister that I didn't know I had. Wow. Wow. But when I met my birth mother, the first thing she said was this, I know you're dying to know why I gave you up. And I was like, shoot, lady, that's an understatement. <laughs> she looked me in the eyes and she said, to give you a chance. Mm. And when I sat back and looked at, so what you're doing is giving these children these youth a chance. I went to I went to school uh, early in life. I took a trip to uh, Fort Worth, uh, Texas, to go to Divide Institute of Technology, and I took the bus down. And on my way down, I stopped at uh, Waco in Waco, Texas, wow. and I was on the college campus, and everybody was calling me Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. I was like, my name is Eric. Little did I know, I had a brother around the same age as me from Brooklyn at Waco College. My dad had a whole wow. nother family, man. <laughs> you know that? And you walked in there, Kevin. Right. And looking like him. Looked like, looked like him. Wow. Everybody, was, they were calling me Kevin. Uh, I lost him a couple of years ago. He got uh, caught up that. on crack. Wow. Uh, when I was in the 88th precinct, mm. he got arrested one time and the prisoner van came by and he said, my, that's my brother inside there. So we don't know the roads and the journey we on. And sometimes people look over our lives and it sounds so unreal that it's hard mm -hmm. for them to understand. This is the life we live. Exactly. You know, we exactly. didn't go home to Father Knows Best. Exactly. Somebody wasn't standing there waiting for us. We had to figure it out. In many cases, we didn't have all the answers. It's like those boys and girls in the Bronx that created hip hop. People thought they had nothing, but they had everything necessary right. inside of them. And, and, and that's the beautiful thing. Every, I tell people, everybody has a story that could change and save a life. Well said. Don't call me a celebrity because that is something I could never be. I am you and you are me. But people well don't know that unless we share and communicate. Um, Mr. Mayor, there's no such thing as a generation gap. Mm. Where the OGs and the young Gs don't get along. It's a communication and sharing of information gap. Well said. The reason why hip hop is so great is we looked at what James Brown was doing. We looked at what Sly and the Family Stone was doing. We looked at what Aretha was doing and Curtis Mayfield. Even the rock stars, we read about what David Bowie was doing. We educated ourselves with the information so that when we got up on that mic, when we got up on that stage, okay, we're going to get some money. Okay, it's all fortune and fame. But there's a responsibility to you in that position. That's something that Grandmaster Flash and the Furries Five <laughs> taught us to Funky Four Plus One. Right. The Plus One was a female girl, Sha Rock, the only one <laughs> at the beginning of time, one girl in the midst of all of these dudes, bold enough to get on that mic and show that she belonged there. And open the door for so many more. And so many uh, more. Adidas, you won that big uh, endorsement, yeah. first non-athlete endorsement. But I do want to touch mm -hmm. on something uh, before we close. It had to, be in, had to have been a dark moment in your life uh, when you lost, you know. Jam Master J. Yes, uh, you know, to gun violence. Jam, to yeah. gun violence. People, you know, often don't realize it was gun violence. You know, he, something even that we he fought couldn't for. get away from it. Right, something we fought against. Yeah. Uh, where were you? How did I you I remember hear? that was, we were supposed to go to the next day down to um, Washington, D.C. to perform halftime after Washington Wizards game. Mm -hmm. So I'm at home. And first it was the 10 o'clock news, Channel 5 and Channel 9. Jam Master J shot in studio. So now I go, all right, maybe somebody did get shot. 
because, you know, it's Queens, it's Hollis, right, right. but not Jay. They're just right. saying Jay Master Jay shot. So it didn't sink in. So 11 o'clock, see, turn it to two, turn it to four, turn it to seven. Okay, this must be something. But then again, maybe somebody did get shot up in there, mm. but it wasn't Jay. So my manager, Eric, who is here with me now, his daughter calls, crying. They mm. killed Jay. Still didn't believe it. I'm living in Jersey at this time. I get in my, me and my wife, we get in a car, we get a babysitter, we drive to Queens, 165th Terminal is where the studio is at. I right know by the very bus, well. Across the street from the precinct. Hold up. Right across the street from the precinct. Yes. A block from the library. So <laughs> this is when it was reality, Mr. Mayor. I pull up, I see Chuck D of Public Enemy, and I see Ed Lover from Yo! MTV Raps bawling like little kids. Mm. And... What's crazy is Jay could have had his studio in Hollywood. He could have had a studio in Manhattan down the block from Puffy's studio. He chose to keep his studio five minutes mm. from where he grew up because he found a doorway out. He left that doorway open for others. And I remember I was online and I put, um, I put, I, I typed in, I'm not mad at the dude that shot Jay. I should have never did that, Mr. Mayor. I got cursed out like my stream was like crazy, crazy. I said, no, let me explain myself. I said, my fight isn't against the brother, the person that shot Jay. My fight is so, I said, our fights are so much bigger. What do you mean, DMC? My fight is against the mentality that will cause a person to do that. Hmm. He didn't just stop Jay's life. He stopped the next producer, the next manager, the next um, filmmakers, stuff like that. So when I started explaining them, like, like to, when I started to explain myself like that, it was like, yo, D, that's right. Because that guy that pulled the trigger didn't realize he didn't have to. Right. So right. hip hop, for us, you know, our parents can tell us stuff. You know, we can read about it in history books. We can, um, we can get chaperoned and we can get um, um, taught not to do these things. The one thing that was so powerful in hip hop it was us young people talking to each other. The Zulu Nation was the biggest street gang in New York City who mm. said, we got to stop being a gang and shooting and selling drugs in our community. Let's become the Zulu Nation. So how are we going to get through? Instead of shooting and selling drugs, we're going to dance. We're going to play some music. We're going to do art. Graffiti was wrong. Right, right, I tell right. people, graffiti was wrong because we was riding on property <laughs> we didn't own. But when those people in the properties that didn't want us riding on their walls said, yo, Let's give them a canvas. Right. So right. we created the attention to have people give us opportunity, but we were showing something that was positive and had a lot of potential to change us. So love it, love the, it. The, 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 the young brothers and sisters, Jay and Pac and Big Dying, oh, it hurts my heart. But what hurts my heart more is the Jay Pox and Bigs that die every day. Mm, that's right. That's, that's who right. we fighting for, and Mr. They, Man. And what, what, what goes in the grave with them. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. So as we close, what's next? Uh, the next thing for me to do is continue to do what I've been doing ever since um, I've, I was put in this position. Um, I used to just go to colleges to speak for the paid lectures, right? And I would go and speak and tell my story. And those college professors was like, B, you got to take that story to the high school. So I go to the high school. And when I get to the high school, they nervous because, you know, a lot of the kids, I don't want to take the money out the, the, the school systems. They want to pay me. I go, no, keep it in for the kids. And I'll speak at the high school. Then those teachers will go, D, you got to take this to the middle school. <laughs> so I'm like, OK. And I go to the middle school. And then I get to the middle school. D, you got to go to the elementary school. So for me to go to elementary school, I had to put myself in a scenario that kids can relate to. So I don't know, after dominating the world, walking this way in my Adidas with Errol Smith and Jay to tell the world how tricky life can be. I'm in colleges, I'm in high schools, um, I'm in elementary schools, um, I'm in group homes, I'm in foster care agencies. I speak all over the world for mental health. What's next is this, Mr. Mayor, wherever you need me to mm. be or anybody listening to me, that's where I'm supposed to be. You know what? Let me tell you something. And I'll rock a good rhyme when I'm there, too. Now, let's not forget that. Uh, I, all I know is who would have thought hip-hop would have taken us this far, and I'm going to do the rest of my life. I'm just going to walk this way. Yes. That's <laughs> what we, and it's going to be a good walk while we at it. My man. Thank good you. Good to see you, man. 
And you know what? I'm, I'm going to read this book. Thank you. Thank uh, Darryl you. Darryl McDaniels, 10 Ways Not, not to Commit, commit suicide. suicide. Remember, we don't have to. Thank you. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you.